All right. So I'm sitting here with David Spector. We just uh, we just left our uh, our Friday morning uh, group meeting where we we sit and talk about what it's like to talk about the issues. Um, and yeah, we we were emailing over the over the last week and uh, wanted to just have a conversation about what David does, a little bit about his uh, his experience of how he came into this way. I want to say way of being, and uh, just go from there. You know, uh, so. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I know I want to talk about your uh, style of meditation, the technique that you were describing to me. But I, but before we start there, I'd like to know a little bit about your story, your your life experience. What brought you into practicing uh, this? Because I don't I don't even know how to what what to call what it is we do or what it is I do. Like it's some form of contemplative awareness or something. Okay, well, I need to start with something just for you, Adam, which is that I'm not going to be talking about non-duality today. That is what you're very interested in. That's what we're both interested in and participate in this group, that the group that you were referring to. Um, we both are interested in non-duality as a philosophy, but that is not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about transcending. Transcending is a mental technique. It is not a philosophy. It is a mental technique that takes us from the normal waking state of consciousness to transcendental consciousness. What is transcendental consciousness, for heaven's sake? Well, it's not something esoteric or mysterious. Transcendental consciousness is simply a fourth state of consciousness that we normally do not experience. Why don't we experience it? Just because we grow up in a stressed society. That's the reason. We live in a stressed world. We don't have access to full knowledge about ourselves because we live in a stressed world. So, <clears throat> What is transcendental consciousness? Transcendental consciousness is a state of rest, just like sleeping or dreaming. Sleeping, dreaming, and waking are our three basic states of consciousness. We go through them in rotation each day. And the purpose of sleeping and dreaming is to allow the stresses that have built up in us in, during the waking state to be released. And that release is called dreaming. It's only deep sleep that can cause that release, that, that dreaming state to happen. Once that's happened, we are refreshed. We may not recognize it ourselves because it's fairly subtle, but we're refreshed and we can wake up and we can drink our coffee or whatever we need to do and then have another effective day, have another productive day based on having slept. Well, sleep alone does not eliminate all of the stresses that we accumulate during the day. There are some that accumulate and create problems over time, particularly as a result of childhood trauma. A child has a lowered threshold of experience, meaning that they're easily overwhelmed by experience. And when they're overwhelmed by experience, that causes a, an internal stress to be stored in the nervous system. And it's very much like the circuit breakers in your house. If there's an overload of an electric circuit in your house, a circuit breaker will open, preventing the electricity from flowing in that particular area of the house. Why? Because the flow of too much electricity can cause a fire. That's the reason for the circuit breakers. So we have to go and re fix the problem, whatever the short circuit is, and then reset the circuit breaker. The human body doesn't quite work like that. We don't have circuit breakers that are accessible, but the nervous system does have a way of protecting itself, and that is called stress. When an overload of experience happens, whether it's in a child or an adult, a stress is created. The purpose of the stress is to reduce the functioning of the nervous system so that that overload does not recur. 
If, if we're almost hit by a car, we'll feel fear and there'll be an overload, there'll be a stress caused, so that the next time that we're almost hit by a car, it won't be so bad. We won't be so traumatized. The problem with this mechanism, which is a natural mechanism, is that over time we accumulate all of these dead areas of our nervous system. And as our nervous system becomes increasingly deader, we have more and more problems in our life because we're not functioning 100 percent yeah and it it, it kind of like the way i'm like picturing it is that it kind of builds up rust over time like a like if we're our bo body's a machine in some sense it rust it creates rust and then yes the like only difference is that the rust requires some external influence to clean that rust out whereas the nervous system can repair itself Right. And that's, and I was going to, you know, when you were describing, you know, um, I was picturing what it was like for me um, when my body was rusted a lot, like the morning times I would, because o over a period of time, because of all the stress and all the thoughts building up, it would be like waking up would be painful. We call it depression. We call it whatever you want to call it, but it would be absolutely very visceral. That's it. That's where our depression comes from. That's where anxiety comes from. That's where our jealousy comes from. That's where every single psychological problem comes from, from these stresses caused by overloads of experience. And, and they accumulate over time. And it's funny because you're right. Like there is no uh, switch breakers in the psyche. It's not like we can go to the, like you, you, that was a metaphor that you used to, what is it, the breaker? circuit breaker circuit breaker yeah but we're dealing with a psyche which i can't necessarily even see yeah we can't see the inner our inner workings but the nice thing is that rest we know from sleep and dreaming we know that rest can refresh the nervous system can eliminate the stresses we just need a deeper form of rest and that deeper form is transcending the fourth state of consciousness, which is discussed in many, um, many uh, scriptures of the um, of the uh, of India, going back thousands of years. So the philosophy of yoga in India, the philosophy of, uh, of Vedanta, and several other of the six systems of philosophy deal in part with these stresses, with these overloads, and how to gain deep rest to reverse them, to eliminate them. Okay, um, so a little bit about myself, because yeah, you were I interested mean, well, in my I'm, background. I'm loving, I'm loving everything you're sharing. I can't, I'm already know I'm going to love listening back to this. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so I started in 1970 um, as a software engineer, uh, going to work one day, I saw a poster that had Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's uh, picture, photo on it, and said that there would be a, an introductory meeting to talk about Transcendental Meditation. And I, that rang a little bell in my mind because my mother had been bugging me to try Transcendental Meditation. Uh, my sister had tried it. Um, I was resistant. I said, well, that that's the sort of thing you like to do. Uh, it's not the sort of thing I like to do. I'm, I'm more scientifically oriented and I have uh, emotional problems. I had a, a number of uh, uh, excuses for why I, I wasn't interested. But I saw the photo and I thought, well, it's right on my way to work at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So why not just stop by and, and uh, hear that lecture? So I did that night. Um, there were, it was an unusual lecture. Instead of one teacher speaking, there were six um, people who, n not all of which were teachers. Some of them were just meditators who had learned transcendental meditation. They were speaking about their own experiences with it. So <clears throat> I found that a very engaging uh, way of learning about transcendental meditation. And I discovered it wasn't esoteric or mystical the way it sounds, transcendental meditation sounds very mystical to me. Um, but it turned out to be a very practical kind of technique. 
And these people were uh, just smiling so much, and I, I couldn't get over uh, how beautiful their smiles were, regardless of whatever the content was that they were presenting. Um, I was very impressed by their confidence and their smiles, and I wanted that. Uh, it sounded something good to me. So I learned Transcendental Meditation <clears throat> that weekend. So that was um, September 26, 1970, when I learned Transcendental Meditation in the student uh, the student Union building of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I remember it today, remember the instruction today. Um, I didn't quite get all of it, but I got enough of it that I could convince myself after one uh, session, after one meditation session, that this was actually something that could work. It wasn't just talk. It wasn't just the usual kind of people convincing other people to do something either in order to make money or in order to assuage their ego or whatever. This was really something that could work. And I actually went back to my meditation center, the Philadelphia Meditation Center, which was at the University of Pennsylvania in those days. I went back uh, day after day uh, to have uh, support from them uh, to make sure that I was practicing correctly because I had so many intellectual questions as well as experiential questions. Uh, because my background was as a software engineer and I was very oriented towards thinking and, and, and uh, understanding, intellectual understanding. And after many, many visits, I finally got it. I finally got how effortless it is and how easy it is. And it really started working for me. And it worked so well that when they started saying there are uh, weekend um, advanced courses that we have available, they, they, they're called advanced courses, but they really were more like retreats. So I went to these weekend retreats, several of them, and each time I went, I had another boost of energy and a boost of, of insight. And, and, and it just was clear, clearer and clearer to me that this technique really, really was eliminating stresses so that I became more functional. Oh. So that, that same fall in October, this, that was September that I learned. In October, I went away to Spain to learn to be a teacher of transcendental meditation. I just left my, left my work. I just went and I spent a lot of money because it cost money to get there. It cost money to live there, but it was worth it to me. And I took three or four, I can't remember now exactly which, teacher training courses in a row, a total of eight and a half months in residence with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And this gave me a solid background for practicing. It gave me a solid background for teaching. Then much later, I, I, was, I had to go back to my career in software engineering to make, to make a living. But much, much later, I, um, I decided that I really wanted to help the world with my knowledge. Why? continue to do software engineering and accumulate money. So I just dropped what I was doing. And uh, I looked around on the web, I discovered this thing called natural stress relief, which was a, a kind of a international open organization that teaches a comparative technique, an alternative technique. And I was skeptical at first that it was going to be as good as transcendental meditation. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized that the people who put the course together originally were very, very bright people, particularly uh, Dr. Fabrizio Coppola in Italy, who became my friend. We worked together at Natural Stress Relief to try to improve the world and to do it by teaching meditation over the internet and 
oh, and using the US mail, using international mail to reach people with a course, a written course that would be absolutely complete. We did our best with that course. And so far we've had about 6,000 or 7,000 clients all over the world, mostly in the United States and just tremendous success. What year did you start that? So that was 2006, okay. January. And so you, you've been doing uh, software engineering. You were in the workforce from when you got back from Spain till about 2006? Yes, I was a software engineer for 40 years. Right on. And so you- And I retired in 2000. Um, so you had, in, in 2000, you retired? I did. So you had about- what did you do for those six years before starting the natural stress healing? I lived off of my savings and it, it uh, got to a point where it was getting ridiculous. <laughs> did you, so what, what um, I'm curious, I'm curious about your um, uh, transcendence, what that looks like to you. What does that, cause I've, I've used, I've seen you use the words, um, 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 pure consciousness. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could maybe describe a little bit to like uh, what that looks like. Sure. So let me describe a typical meditation session using this technique of NSR or natural stress relief meditation. Sure. You're uh, as part of the course, you're given preparation and you're given um, a meaningless sound called a mantra or a syllable. And that is the, a vehicle of inward exploration. And it's not so much, there's nothing magical about the sound. It's simply a meaningless sound that works well for transcending. Uh, what makes it work is the way that it's used the way that the Course teaches how to use the sound. And that is a way that is completely effortless. Most of the things we do in life are not effortless. Um, if we want to become a better student in school, we're told, do spend your time with the homework. It's really worth it. You know, work hard at your homework, read the textbook, go to the library and find other books on the subject that you're studying so that you get a deeper understanding. In other words, the message is put effort into the process. And this applies to everything in our life, including relationships, put effort into, into the process. That's the advice that's always given. Right. It's actually the wrong advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it backfires all the time. Oh yeah. Um, and, and we all know students in school who got straight A's who never did a lick of work. They didn't even open the book so far as we could tell. They, mm -hmm. they certainly didn't do their homework. How does that work? Well, the way it works is your nervous system has to function better. If your nervous system functions better, you learn easier. And everybody has different temperaments. Everybody, like I didn't, I didn't choose how I was wired. I didn't, I don't choose what I'm interested in or curious about, but the, I guess the societal or like the expect, expectation narrative of like, well, if I want to be a quote unquote success, or I want to be, um, add value to the world, I need to work harder. And that is very, that's been detrimental. At least we choose our own way of working. That's, that's a good thing. Right. Not everybody has even that choice, but um, yes, it's, it's good to work hard, but it's also better to work effectively. Right. And if you work effectively, you get happy. You enjoy your productivity. That's different from working at a job that you hate, where you have to keep pushing yourself. You do not enjoy that. Right. And that's why a lot of people end their week on a Friday night or Saturday night drinking. They just, that's, that's it. They're, they're, they're doing something they don't like with their, work, their life. They're not satisfied. And they turn to drink just to have some sort of coping mechanism. Did you and find... it's a horrible coping mechanism because 
you know, it reduces our, our judgment, uh, re results in, in uh, so many bad uh, uh, side effects. Did you find but that even one? The one, even, the, even, the, um, uh, e even when we seek out diversions that aren't so harmful as alcohol, um, they don't work. They, we keep having to do them over and over again. We have to keep trying different things. Uh, we, we keep trying our relationships. We keep trying to have a stable relationship with someone we really love and who really loves us. And it keeps having problems. And so we try again. We, we leave that person. We try again. And we try again. And it always works at first. So we think there's something good to it, but it doesn't eventually work. And that's because of stress, stress in the nervous system. It's invisible, but it's the actual cause of all of our psychological problems, most of our psychological problems. There are also actual physiological brain disorder, brain imbalances and neurotransmitters. There are a number of physical things that can go wrong that require medical intervention. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about a normal, typical adult life is filled with problems and filled with little happiness, times of happiness here and there that don't last. So, you know, um, I want to I want to go. So the transcendence, the like, ac I want to jump a little ahead, but like accessing that transcendent state, right? Yes, I was starting to talk about that and I went off into other things. No, no, this is it's good. It's good because, I, you know, I, I know that we have some listeners that have been with me through this course of me attempting to understand myself right now. Yes. I've since, now I've since realized that there is no myself. There is the self. Yes. Right. That's true. And that's what and that's what I was uh, I was hoping. Did, when did you come to that? realization when did you come to that awareness was it your, during well, your software experientially work? i came to that awareness during my teacher training course in transcendental meditation in spain yes in spain what was that like can you describe that i had an experience of pure awareness pure consciousness and in that experience it was it was actually an experience of falling asleep you see when most of us fall asleep, we think there's a loss of consciousness. We think that nothing is, has happened, that time has somehow stopped for us until we woke up. But that's not what happens. When we go to sleep, consciousness is still there. The problem is when we wake up, we don't remember it. Just like we can't remember certain dreams, we know there was a dream. We know that it was important to us. We, we know we, it was, we were enjoying it. And we're trying our damnedest to find it in our short-term memory so that we can switch it over to our long-term memory and we can't find it. <laughs> How often, yeah. right? It happens all yeah. the time to me. It's like trying to remember what it was like before you were born. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, I had an experience of falling asleep, although I didn't feel like falling asleep, but, but of waking up. Falling asleep and waking up, that, that sounds contradictory, but they're two different things. I fell asleep in that system of three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. I was in the sleep state, but in terms of, the, of, the, uh, of my access to consciousness, I was fully awake and aware. I was fully in the waking state. And that state is called transcendence. Hold on, let me, let me repeat that so I got it. So your body was asleep. My body was asleep. But you, became, you came awake and you were consciously aware that your body was asleep. Yes, I was aware that my senses were not functioning and that my mind was not functioning. Wow. And that happened, did it happen in class? It's not just me. <laughs> this is reported by, by all no, of these non the teachers same, that you're I've following. Same, I've had the same experience. It's, it happened to me last summer. Excellent. Yeah, exact same thing. It was like, um, there was like a thin, a thin tether that if it would have been cut, I'd have been totally disassociated 
with the world of form and matter. Matter of fact, when I did come back into my body and woke up, I remember looking at the room I was in, in the, in the fan and the movement and all this motion. And I turned, I look at them in the mirror next to the bed and I saw my body and it was no different than anything else in the room. It was just another thing in the room. Whereas consciousness is not another thing in the room. It is the observer. It's the only observer there is. There may be million, billions of us, 7.23 billion human beings, but there's only one consciousness. There's only one, one, one entity that is aware. And that entity has no, has no features of, of being an individual. It's a universal entity. Now, how does, I want to get back to how NSR works. Wait, 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 wait. But, what, but after you had that experience, you're, you're in Spain and you suddenly recognize that David the body is not like, how did you, how did, were you expecting that to occur? Or how did you, did it change the way you moved in the world? Did anything happen? No, no. <laughs> you're just like, all right. I, I understood it because of the fact that I had been going through TM teacher training. Right. So I had the intellectual apparatus, the knowledge to deal with it. Right. I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, some people have that experience of awakening and they, they have to go see a doctor. They have to go see a psychiatrist because yeah. they think they're going, they think they're dissociating and going crazy. That yeah. it's not dissociation. It's not a bad mental state. It's actually seeing the way things are. Yeah. I had no framework for any of this stuff at all like it you know so when it occurred and for me and i and i've seen it in people that come to our group when it occurs in them there's we don't have i guess in the western world we just don't have a mental framework to understand it and there's a reason for that the reason is stress the reason is that stress has warped people and warped society to the extent that we're lucky that we have public education at all much less that it's of good quality Right. There is so much greed in this world. There is so much acting against human values in this world for the sake of the dollar. Right. Huh. The solution is simple. People just need to find themselves and finding themselves means um, eliminating all of that stress within the nervous system. And I I've looked around and I can't find very many ways to do that. I see only two types of practices that efficiently bring you out of stress into full functioning. And that is non-duality, which you've, you're very concerned with, and uh, transcending, which is what I teach. All right, let's go into it. <laughs> so I'm dealing with people who do not have a, a background of any sort of specific understanding in terms of uh, any of these uh, issues that we're talking about. They don't understand what stress is. They don't understand where it comes from. They don't understand how to get rid of it. All they know is that they read somewhere or they heard from their friend or their relative that NSR did something good for them. So they wanna learn. And they have a feeling inside that there's some lack, something lacking in their life. Usually it's one of two things. Either it's a psychological problem, such as I have a tremendous amount of anxiety when I'm around other people. That is a typical kind of problem. Uh, or uh, it's I have a very successful life, but the success I'm like at, I'm, I'm like at an edge where, where any more success and I'm, I'm, there's, I'm in danger of failing. Um, I, the, the success is there, but it's also taking a toll on me and I need more refreshment inside to deal with this success. So two, two different kinds of people, successful people and people with problems. So NSR is attractive to both of those kinds of, of, uh, of, of backgrounds. So when a person sits down to practice NSR, which is what I was starting to say before, Say the, what the acronym stands for again one more time. Natural Stress Relief. 
Got it. We just, you know, like transcendental meditation is a good term because it refers to a form of meditation in which you transcend. And they've trademarked the term, so I can't use that term. Right. Um, they uh, insist that their teaching is unique, that nobody else can duplicate it. And uh, in other words, they don't want competition. And I experienced this when they threatened me with lawsuit. Really? Yes. I had I to stop it was comparing. Like, I, didn't, I didn't know Transcendental Meditation was like an organization. <laughs> oh, very much so. Is it really? Oh, yes. They have, they have very uh, eager legal representation. So if anybody, so if anybody's practicing mantras, they want them to be referring to it as transcendental meditation? They want it not to be referred to as transcendental meditation. They want only their technique, their teaching to be referred to as transcendental meditation because they own the, the trademark on that term. Wow. That's what the law supports. But isn't it, isn't it wild that anybody people know that when you say transcendental meditation lately i knew that that it was a mantra based system not everyone knows that oh the oh. tm people never call it mantra meditation who don't the transcendental meditation people themselves right the teachers never call it call it uh, mantra meditation they just call it tm they call it TM because they, they want to emphasize that it's unique. It is totally different from the most popular form of meditation that exists, which is being aware of breathing. <laughs> That's a good one too. It's actually a very destructive technique. Um, all, the, all of my clients who have problems learning NSR are uh, are uh, people who have learned breathing awareness or heartbeat awareness, but mostly breathing awareness. It is very popular, but it also keeps the attention on the breathing, does not allow the attention to go to any subtler states and transcend those states so that it can experience pure consciousness. Right. And, and, you, and the NSR, you guys have, you guys have figured out or kind of, you guys have distilled this thing into a digestible form of how to access it? Yes, we, we've distilled it and we, we also take things from, from other teachings when they're relevant. We don't, uh, we don't say we're, we're only going to learn from Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. We, we learn from, from everybody who has something to teach. Do you feel that when you- meet I learn a lot from my clients. That's what I was going to ask. Like when you meet with your clients, it's almost like you've got a suppository of insight, right? So it's certain things work differently with certain people. We, we have a depository of <laughs> insight, not a suppository. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, so can you so describe for me a little bit about when you meet with someone who comes in and they're like, you know, I'm interested in NSR. I'm interested in what you guys are saying. I have all this stress. I know I'm missing something. There's something off. It doesn't even work that way. No, I don't. No, people don't come to me. They don't. No, they're they're in their own home. They use the internet. Oh, I know, but like they'll show up on your screen. No. 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 All they do is fill out an order form, send $47, and I send them the course in the mail. That's it? That's it. They take the course themselves. It's a step-by-step -step course, six lessons over three consecutive days, and they learn how to transcend. What? And it works. <laughs> it works every time. There's never been a failure in learning how to transcend. Real? What is the what is in the course? Like, what is it like? Do you read stuff? Watch stuff? Listen to stuff? It's a manual. It's a manual with six lessons. You read. You read material. You then close your eyes and follow the instructions. You then open your eyes and continue reading. Really? Really? It remi it's reminded me of uh, similar <laughs> to the Course in Miracles. I was I did that for like a month and a half. 
where it was like each day there was an exercise. I would read it. It would tell me what to do. And then I would practice it that day. It has very little to do with The Course in Miracles. <laughs> <laughs> this is really effective. This instruction, the, 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 um, there's a lot of preparation and there's a lot of explanation, but the heart of the instruction is simple. It's simple. It's, um, it's the instruction for following a thought backwards in its process of evolution in the mind. A thought comes from somewhere. We don't know where because its origin is obscured, but it bubbles up to, to consciousness. And we, we suddenly realize, oh, I'm hungry. Or, oh, the national income of Norway is such and such. <laughs> yeah, it's seemingly from nowhere. But it's possible to follow a thought backwards from its bursting on our, in our awareness back to where it's just a sprouting. Right. That's a subtler level of thinking. That's the problem with breathing awareness. It keeps you from experiencing that whole range of the mind, it keeps you right on the surface level of consciousness. That's where breathing is. That's where actions are, right on the surface level. That's where thoughts are, right on the surface level. So we have no opportunity to see where did the thought come from. The thought yeah. came from pure consciousness, but how? To, in order to understand that, we have to be able to follow that thought in our awareness. Yeah, that's that's been that's what it's felt like. It's been at least I, my way of like. It's it's been a uh, like a method of inquiry. Like in the sense that, well, I, I thought I could figure out why these things were occurring, these thoughts, these feelings, the world. Why is things the way they are? I felt like if I could. You can't. They hide themselves. Right. Yeah. That's then, the nature of stress. It hides itself. And then, and then, I guess, then I saw that everything is spontaneously occurring. Like, it's all spontaneous. It's all creative expression, really. So why can't we be spontaneous? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's, it's, you that's can't, the thing. You can't, you can't. I can't decide to be spontaneous. I either am or I'm not. <laughs> it's like I can't plan a spontaneous expression. And the reason for that is stress in the nervous system. Oh, all, of, all of these thousands of little deadenings in our, in our nervous system, in the brain, that cause our limitations, our problems, our lack of seeing, our lack of being able to perform our lack of happiness, our lack of peace, our lack of harmony, ability to give and receive love, ability to be creative, ability to be intelligent, ability to be satisfied in life. All of these things are limited, are limited by the pattern of stresses stored in our nervous system. And deep rest can eliminate these stresses one by one, like peeling an onion, one stress will be the one ready to be released. And that stress can be released through deep rest. When that stress has been released, there'll be another stress ready to be released. That's why it requires many sessions of meditation to reach full functioning. I want, I want to ask you, like we mentioned it earlier today, but like the idea that there's no myself, there is the self, right? Yes. And that essentially all forms. They're are, both. They're both. All they're form, both. All form. The, the individual self is real. Our reality is real. Some teachers say it's a dream. And it is from a, step, from a certain point of view. But from our point of view, we are living in reality. And it's absolutely true. There's no mystery to it. However, what we're not connected to is our own awareness. We know that we have it. If I ask you, are you aware of being aware? There'll be a pause as you consider the question. And the answer will pop, 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 pop up. Of course I am. If I weren't, I wouldn't be a functioning human being. 
Of course I'm aware of being aware. So we all know we're aware. The problem is we have a fuzzy experience of it. It's like at a distance or it's hidden or it's deep inside or something. It's obscured. And I've what seen, obscures I've seen it... My, I've seen in, in some sense, it's almost like that there's almost like there's two things going on. There's the thoughts and then there's my voice about the thoughts. And it's like that awareness space is commandeered by judgment or perspective of what is occurring. It's like clouded by, it can become clouded by that in some sense. Yes. Yes. All the thoughts and the analysis about the thoughts are all on exactly the same level, the level of the mind. Right. And what is not on that level is the level that never changes. The right. level that, that doesn't have constant change. And that level is awareness or consciousness. Consciousness does not change. It has no components. It, ha it is not an object. It is not a, a, a thing with a form. It is not a thing. It so is that which observes. So that's what I wanted to ask you. So if, if, if the world of form, let's call it that, the world of matter, the, what we're doing, um, if we're all spontaneously expressing from, a, from this nothingness or this void or the space of stillness, right? Essentially, what no. it really... No? No, we don't typically express from, this, from the space of fullness. No, no, no. Consciousness nullness, does. Nullness. 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 Um, what does that mean? Good. What nullness? You mean like nothingness? Yeah. But no, nothingness. Really nothingness it. being nothing can't create anything. Nothingness being nothing can't create anything. Correct. It's mysticism to say that everything springs out of nothing. That's mysticism. That's esoteric philosophy. It's not non-dual. It's not non-dual. It's not the yoga philosophy that's behind NSR. It's somebody's idea of mysticism. Ah. Consciousness is not nothingness. Consciousness is all that actually exists. That includes all of us. It includes all that could possibly be. It includes all matter, space, time, energy, events, objects, lack of objects. It's, it's all contained within consciousness. Consciousness is the creative impulse that is all that fundamentally exists. But now, see, we're getting into non-dual philosophy, which is not what I'm here to talk about. <laughs> I know it's fascinating to the mind. I know. How come you don't want to talk about it? <laughs> because it's not practical. I'm aim I said at the beginning yeah. that I'm aimed at two kinds of people. My audience is two kinds of people. Uh -huh. People with psychological problems, I feel anxious. And people who are successful but are finding it hard to cope, need more need more refreshment. That's what I wanted to ask you. How come? Why, why do you have an aim? Like, why, where's the, have you looked at that? Like, because why? this is what most of the 7.2 billion people live with every day. Right. Very few people are in your privileged situation where they have the time, the money, the interest to engage in not learning about non-dual philosophy and other such stuff. Right. I'm interested in the majority of humankind. So it's almost like a calling, like you feel called to, to share the message as effectively as you can? Yes, I do. Okay. And I get feedback that I'm sharing it effectively, and that keeps me going. Okay. Hey, that's, what I, that's what I was curious about. Because... Uh, um... I, how else could I get... 3,200 clients with no publicity, no advertising. How else? Yeah. Like if it weren't else? effective. If oh, it weren't no. effective. I'm, not, I'm not questioning the validity of the method. I, I'm curious about your experience. Like why feel called to um, like, well, 
You've heard you've heard of, of Buddhism, this the Bodhisattva um, um, decision that I could stay in bliss forever, but I choose to come back to Earth in order to help others. Ah, oh. you've heard of that, right? Yeah, yeah. That's it's a basic human desire to help others when you're able to. Huh. What, how come how come the, there's a price associated with it? A what? A price. How come there's a price? Oh, associated? because people don't respect what they get for free. I had two clients who told me that they, two individual clients, separate clients, who at separate times told me that they were living out of their car and they could not afford even the $47 for this course. I said, fine with me. You get the course for free. I only ask for one thing in return, that you send me an email after you've learned the course and practiced it for a week or two and tell me what, what it's done for you, what kinds of effects you've noticed. They said, yes, of course, we will do that. I will do that. Neither of them did it. Wow. And of course, there were a lot of other people who were not living in cars who said, I would like, you know, maybe I'll pay $20 instead of 47. I said, fine. I no longer do that. If you can't put together $47 for something that will change your life, <laughs> oh. you're not going to get you're not going to get it through this method. No. You wow. know, you need some more time suffering. <laughs> All right, let's talk about suffering. I, hey, I'm loving this. Um, so have you had any experience? We, we mentioned in the email that you understood uh, some of these uh, lower states of, I, I don't wanna use the word lower, but like, uh, let's just say uh, unenjoyable states of consciousness. I'm not following you, sorry. Um, like lower states of consciousness, like uh, your experience with, um, the only lower states of consciousness are states where you have stresses in the nervous system. Right. And that I, impairs your, your functioning. And so the goal of NSR is to restore full functioning, to bring us back home to peace and happiness through transcending. We transcend thought, even the finest impulse of thought, to experience our true nature which is pure consciousness. We discover it through the technique. We don't have to imagine it. We don't have to do any other practice, just this simple NSR. Does it, does it, um, does it uh, alleviate the sense of me, the personal identity? No, it's very natural and gradual. What it does is it makes you feel like you have less problems like you're enjoying life more. And you may notice some specific result. Uh, for example, if you, um, if you have diagnosed uh, a diagnosed disorder like uh, general anxiety disorder, GAD, and you start NSR, you might notice right away that your, G your GAD is much, uh, much uh, reduced. Or you might not. Because we remember I talked about stress as being like an onion mm -hmm. in terms of releasing them. So it might be that the stress for uh, your general anxiety disorder might be very deep inside that onion. So it might take a long time to get to. Right. I, I had depression, but it took me years and years before I eliminated enough stresses that I actually eliminated the depression. Where, where do you start? Did you start externally or internally? What does that mean? Like you said, there was years of stresses that you had to work through before you could get to. Oh, when I said work through, I, I, I'm sorry, I gave the wrong impression. We are not working on stress. There is no other technique involved. Only NSR meditation, which is effortless and natural. You said it took a while though, yeah? It's a process of deep rest and it takes a while to get at the deeper stresses. The surface stresses are eliminated immediately in the very first meditation. That's why people feel so 
usually give me such positive feedback after their first lesson. That's why I wanted to ask you if you could describe a little bit about your experience with depression and the process that you went in regards to. Well, like many other people, I experienced, I had severe depression called dysthymia. It's a form of depression. And it lasted for, uh, for many years. Um, I didn't have it when I was a small child, but I don't know, somewhere in my childhood, it started happening. And uh, I got quite deadened in, in certain ways and, um, and uh, unhappy. And I could never quite pin down why. It took a long time before I even got diagnosed. But I finally went to a psychiatrist and got the right tests and got diagnosed as having dysthymia. So once I had dysthymia, once I knew that that's what it was, I got appropriate treatment, which was medications and talk therapy. And I went through that for years and years. But meanwhile, I, I learned Transcendental Meditation and I was meditating as I was taking the medications and as I was going through the talk therapy. So it's, I can't say, I can't point my finger at one thing and say, that's the reason why my depression disappeared. But I do know that around 2009 or 2010, the depression lifted and it was very clear that I no longer needed medicine. I no longer needed a psychiatrist. I talked to my psychiatrist in depth about it, and he said, um, I confirm that you don't need me anymore. You don't need these medicines anymore. You're reporting normal, um, normal moods, normal, uh, um, I forget what it's called, but normal functioning of the mind in terms of mood. I had a mood disorder called dysthymia, and it lifted. And it lifted permanently as a, as a fact, as a matter of fact, right before it lifted, I had been picking and biting at my fingernails for many years. And I started noticing uh, for about over the course of one or two weeks, I started noticing that one by one, I, I had stopped picking or biting a fingernail until there was only one left I think it was this finger, I'm not sure, it might have been this finger, uh, that I was still biting and picking at, and then that stopped. Hmm. No intention to do it, just happened uh, uh, very quickly over the course of a week. Huh. And it uh, wasn't long after that that the depression lifted. Hmm. I had another experience, which you may find interesting, which was I got cancer. In 2017, I got a diagnosis of cancer. And uh, because of uh, doctors failing to diagnose it properly, uh, it was already advanced. So it was stage four. Stage four rectal cancer is what I had. A big, a big tumor in my, in my rectum. Bum bum. Inside. Yeah, in the, in the colon. Um, and it had spread to the lymph nodes and uh, it spread to my liver. So um, I got the news. I said, oh, that's interesting. And what, I, what do I need to do? And I, I found out about the four or so forms of, of treatment that I would have to go through and that I would have to start immediately. And so uh, life changed quite a bit. Um, I put aside all the other things that I'd been doing like software and just focused on my treatments. And uh, it, here, here comes the part that you're gonna find a little hard to believe. I, I had fun with it. I actually enjoyed it as an adventure. There was no trace of fear of death. There was knowledge that I could die from it. There was no trace of fear. That is, I, I, heard, I was going to ask you, that's what I was trying to get to. I'm so glad you brought this up because I've heard you share this once before and we didn't really go into it because it was, people had quite, it was funny watching this. I'll share about what it was like in the group because 
for some reason, some people may have thought that you were identified with the story when you were really just sharing what had happened. You're not, you don't like, you know, I remember you saying it was so great. You're like, I'm not, I don't want to be identified as a cancer survivor. Like I'm not, you know, I'm just a dude. Um, but it was so fascinating that uh, I come from a time before the use of the word dude. <laughs> I'm just a guy. <laughs> I'm a guy. I'm a human being. <laughs> um, and it was so when you said you had fun, you had fun with it. And then I, I've, I've got so many questions like the mortality, the, when the thought did occur, it just didn't grip you. It just didn't grip your fear sensors. Still doesn't grip me, even though I know I'm probably going to die from it. Cancer has a way of recurring, even after many years. I had an aunt who had breast cancer, and she had her breasts removed. She had another incidence of breast cancer 20 years later, even though she had no breast tissue left. I'm telling you, cancer is... Cancer, the, the thing about cancer is that we all have it. It's just that we have an immune system that fights effectively against it. And the problem that I have is that my genetics were such uh, that I, uh, at, when I reached a certain age, my immune system stopped protecting me. So I am currently unprotected against uh, certain cancers. And uh, cancer of the liver, cancer of the of the uh, lungs. I don't know exactly how it's going to hit, but um, but I'm at risk for all those things. I get a checkup every year, um, but uh, even with the checkup, who knows what will happen. Um, that's reality. I'm not being morbid by talking about it. it. That's reality. But it's only the body. I don't care that much. I am not my body. The me that matters to me is not my body. And when I say fun, for example, 3 a.m. one day when I was in the hospital after my one of my two surgeries, um, my uh, roommate uh, had a he, he was supposed to stay in bed. He had a circulatory problem and he had to stay in bed and he was there was an alarm system in this bed to make sure he stayed in bed. He got out of bed. He, he got it in his head that he was going to go somewhere and do something, and he decided he was going to do it. So he got out of his bed. The alarm went off, and at 3 a.m., people were rushing past my bed to get to his bed. And, and I just had a ball. I, just, I woke up, I, and I watched this happening, and it didn't involve me at all. So... You know, there was no nothing having to do with me, um, but it just was like like you watch a movie and you watch somebody uh, something happening in a movie. People love violent movies. I don't know why, but uh, this certainly wasn't violence, but but it was entertaining. How how, how about when stuff was happening to you, like you were going through treatments yes. or pain, pains like physical yes. pain? Yes, I had pain. And, and it was wonderful that, that, that I knew that there was always a, a pill I could take or an IV that I could take that would eliminate the pain. It's a fact. In my condition, at my point, at my stage in the cancer, the pain could be controlled. Oh. So it wasn't a, a problem intellectually and uh, psychologically. I had gotten over that sort of thing. It just wasn't a problem. It was a problem when I was so overwhelmed with pain that I couldn't function. And my wife had to bring me into the hospital. I had to get, um, what's it called? Uh, I keep forgetting the name, that the standard medicine for pain, uh, IV medicine. Morphine. Um, morphine, thank you, yes. So they, they, they gave me morphine and it got it under control pretty quickly. And, um, and I got past that, that episode. But, and at home, I, had, I frequently had pain. And I had the, med the medicines that gave me the, the pain medicine. And uh, if I had been, a, probably if I had been an ordinary person, by which I mean I had not gone through years of practice of transcending, 
I probably would have gotten addicted to those pills because they gave me so many of them in such variety. Um, I probably would have gotten addicted, but I'm the son of a doctor. I know a little bit about medicine. I know about addiction. I'm familiar with the 12 step program. And I just said no to those medicines most of the time. Only in, in one or two extreme circumstances, I took a pill and the pill worked. I hadn't become um, adjusted to it. I had, my body hadn't, hadn't become adjusted to it, so it worked fine. Right. But the pain was part of the adventure too. I didn't enjoy the pain, but it was part of the adventure. And looking back on it, I, I liked it. I, I liked it because it was different. Huh. Man, I it's love, kind I of love hard love. to describe to somebody who doesn't who doesn't live that way, free from from fear. No, I mean it's 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 uh it's you know how do you become free from fear? People are wondering. We're we're curious. You eliminate the stress that causes the fear. It's just a stress, and it can be eliminated by deep rest. And if, if only it worked efficiently enough, it could be eliminated by sleep or dreaming. But we actually need four states of consciousness, not three. We need transcendental consciousness. It's part of the human makeup to need it. So, you, and I've heard you share this before, that you have, that you, do, you have like a practice that you do twice a day, right? You have. Yes. Can you describe that, what, what it is you do and what, what occurs yes. when you do it? Yes. And my wife does it with me most of the time. Is it and is how long have you been doing this practice? Uh, since September 26, 1970. Okay. And it's do you keep the same times throughout the day or does it like can you just yes. kind of describe it? Yeah, so in the morning around um, 9 915 to 930 in the morning, my wife and I sit down and close our eyes. Uh, one of us uh, starts the timer. So we know how much time has passed. We close our eyes and we follow the procedure that we've learned from our instruction. And we do that for 15 minutes. At the end of that 15 minutes, we open an eye and, and check the time on the timer to see whether it's 15 minutes. And if it's not, we meditate a little longer or if it's over, we don't worry about it. And we come out of meditation. Coming out of meditation just means sitting there with the eyes closed. And then after a few minutes, we open our eyes and we get back into our daily activities. And we do that twice a day, about 930 in the morning and about five o'clock in the afternoon every day without fail every day, because you don't fail to do something that brings you res brings results every time we, we feel refreshed after every meditation no matter what is going on in our life. Whether there's a challenge in our life, whether there's no challenge at all, whether we're in a hospital, it doesn't matter what our circumstances are, we feel refreshment after that 15 minutes because stresses have been released. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share something that I remember you saying, and please do not, I'm just, I'm, I just wanna hear what you say, what, what you think about this. You said, one time you said that, um, those are the moments that you can experience pure consciousness, but it's not accessible or not. And, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing. This might not actually be what you said. It's kind of how I interpreted it. Are you able to access those states when you're not in the medit that, that those two moments of meditation? Yes. Except it's not a state. What I can access is who I am, which is pure consciousness. <laughs> Okay, it's so it's almost there. like a, it's almost Nothing. like a runway, and then like a like you 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 take off on a runway, and then you're landing at five o'clock. I I don't follow that. <laughs> yeah, I just I'm curious to know what what it feels like when you're in when you're in that space. If you, we could refer it as this, it it has a variety of feelings depending on what stress is being released because the. When the stress releases, some of the experience that originally caused the stress can happen at an attenuated fashion.
For example, if we almost get hit by a car, we're nine years old, we almost get hit by a car, tremendous fear wells up and a stress is created. We somehow survive that episode and we don't think about it further. And our life is, has some lack to it as the years go by, but we don't really know why. We're sitting, we learn transcending, whether it's transcendental meditation, whether it's natural stress relief or some other form of transcending, some effective way of accessing this state, this fourth state of consciousness. We learn that and we practice it. At some point, that particular stress that was caused by the experience of fear is now released, mm. being released. And it takes, I don't know, let's say it takes 30 seconds to release. So for that 30 seconds, we are gripped in the feeling of fear, but it's not severe, but we can recognize that it's fear. It's strong enough that we can recognize that it's fear. We may even recognize that it's fear of being hit by a car, but it's not so strong that we uh, want to go see a psychiatrist. It's just a strong feeling that grips us. So it grips us for 30 seconds and then suddenly it's gone. It releases. Suddenly means within a second or two. I'm trying to be as precise as possible here. Yeah. Um, and then we feel free of it. It's no longer there. There's no more fear there. Later on in the day, all of a sudden the colors seem brighter. We're relating to people better because that fear is gone. And more importantly, the stress that caused that fear is gone. That's been, uh, that's been my, that's been, that process you described has been my experience as well. When I started witnessing what was occurring emotionally within myself without trying to fix it or judge it or solve it, I allowed it to occur. I wouldn't even say I allowed it. I just, You witnessed it. Yeah, I witnessed it without trying to fix it or manage it in any way. Over That's time, the only way the stress can release. Right. If there's any interaction with it, it won't release. It was like I used to get hit with these random bouts of shock throughout the day of just pure angst or despair. It would just, and there would be, it'd be, it would be like most of the day it started, like it would be like that for a long time, but then. I mean, it would just be little little pinprick shocks yes. that would bring. Yes, and that's that's the side effects of stress during the day. And the difference between stress and stress release is that after stress release, the stress is no longer there, and you no longer get those side effects. Yeah, they don't they don't tend to occur so much anymore. You've had enough rest in various forms to eliminate it. And when they do, they they don't they last like you described thirty seconds at the most. It's not even that much time. It's typical. And the spit in the time between occurrences, are, it continues to get wider. All of this is natural. So yeah. some people are fortunate enough that this sort of thing happens as they get older. Most people are not fortunate like that. Most people who work at jobs they hate, living with people they dislike, etc., are not free enough to engage in that sort of pr procedure to allow the stresses to release. They get all involved in the stress. They say, this is my story. And there's plenty of opportunity in life on the internet and in person to share your story with other people. And this becomes the holy grail in, in society. I wanna share my story. I wanna listen to other people's stories. And doesn't do a bit of good. There's no good that comes from sharing stories other than perhaps fixing isolated problems caused by greed and injustice and all, all those other problems that we have. They're all rooted in stress. It's a mechanism of the mind to allow the stress to continue to occur. It gives it's it permission. It's a mechanism of the mind and of the stress that it continues its own existence. That is where the fear of death comes from. 
we want to continue our existence, what do we want to continue existing as, as an ego? That ego is rooted in stress. All stress hides itself. We can't see how it actually functions. It's a deadening. Deadening means it hides itself. How can we get rid of something that hides itself? The answer is through a different method, through a, a transcendent, transcendental method, a method yeah. that goes beyond where the stress is, goes beyond the mind. And in this case, it's consciousness. And, and this unique state of deep rest called the fourth state of consciousness. So is there a way to talk about like this state of being without sounding mystical? Yes, I think so. I, I think that the manual, uh, the, I think that my website does a fairly good job of, it talks about reducing stress through depressed. I think you can, I think anybody can understand that. But we arrive at such a, we arrive at transcendence, which is so magnificent. It's so all encompassing. It's like, it's almost un other, otherworldly. It only seems that way when we don't experience it intimately. It seems like something that's apart from us that is magical and will solve all our problems. And, and, and just it's, you know, why doesn't everybody know about this? The same kind of thinking goes into flying saucers. <laughs> why doesn't everybody, why isn't everybody in love with this knowledge of flying saucers or the flat earth? Why doesn't everybody realize that the earth is really flat and not round? Right. I have unique knowledge. <laughs> and if you'd only listen to me, my ego would be so happy. <laughs> oh, man. See, that's not the, the path to enlightenment. Uh-uh. It's not to regard it as magic or mystical. That won't work. Uh -uh. It's, it's us. We're already there in a sense. We just have to get there for real. Yeah. The, for, uh, yeah, I, I just have to get out of the way. The me, the me, the yeah. story, the yeah. story. And, and nothing helps. Society doesn't help. None of the, none of the, um, agencies of society help the school system doesn't help the government doesn't help the free market doesn't help <laughs> nothing helps nothing <laughs> nothing is here to help us have the knowledge of how of stresses and how to get rid of them wow it's so true and and it's an it's simple extension of the ignorance of stress stress hides itself the extension of that in our life in society is that stress is hidden. The knowledge of stress is hidden. So we have the field of psychology that deals with psychological problems. But when you read advanced papers in psychology, you get shocked. I got shocked when I read an advanced paper that said that tension in our life is caused by anxiety. And if we only would realize that, it would, it would instantly solve the problem. Tension is caused by anxiety. Or we could say frustration is caused by tension. Or we could say yeah. anxiety is caused by tension. Uh, you can, any of these psychological terms, just put them together and say that one causes the other. And you've got the makings of a psychological paper. They know so little yeah. about psychology they've actually it's almost like psychology was just a language uh, an erudite language it's like we create yes. this yes and when you find out about individual psychologists as i have uh, several several of them they went into the field because of their own problems right being a solution to their own problems one of my favorites and that's why they started helping other people one of my favorites was uh, Carl Jung. He had a, like a transcendent experience as a child and just wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand why he recognized that he wasn't his body. Like his psyche was something below the surface of what he was experiencing. So it was his curiosity that took him to, to all his language that he's created to help people understand themselves. Yes, he created a whole system. Freud created a whole system. 
Maslow can, can created a system. There's all sorts of systems. Hans Selye created a system. There's all sorts of systems in psychology. Um, none of them are effective. Not one of them will release a single stress. I mean, you can't like it's like that's there what... are effective techniques to get over fear of spiders. There are there are effective psychological techniques for getting over the fear of spiders. But there's no natural technique unrelated to spiders that will get rid of that stress other than transcending Transcending is a state of consciousness, a fourth state of consciousness. It's a state of deep rest with the way it differs from deep sleep is that the mind is awake and alert. And so you become acclimated to the world or yourself as the way things are. So the stress and the tension doesn't occur or learns to not occur? Nope has nothing to do with anything other than outside of ourselves, the world, has nothing to do with the world, has nothing to do with our body, has nothing to do with our mind. It has to do with stress. Stress is, yes, in the body, but it's not the body. And yes, we can be born with stress. Still, it's not the body. It's in the body and it's caused by overloads of experience. And I know this because I see again and again in my clients how stress release works and how effective it is, how it works from the very beginning and keeps working every single session. And that's why people are regular in their practice. Unlike other techniques like learning a language, learning a language, they have to keep, they keep hammering into you that you have to be regular in learning you have to put some time into it every day to learn a language. You don't, you don't have to do that about transcending. Transcending is a natural state of consciousness, just like sleep, dreaming, or waking. Do you have to pound somebody to go to sleep? No. When they get tired enough, they fall asleep. The problem is transcendental consciousness, because the mind is awake, doesn't work that way. It doesn't. We can't spontaneously transcend. We have to learn how to transcend. And that knowledge, which used to be taught in some cultures, is not currently readily available. Mm. All right, well, Let's, uh, how can people, how can people find you if they want to access the course? Well, they can find the website. It's uh, a pretty old looking website. I've actually created a new one, but um, I haven't uh, gotten to the point where I'm ready to do the substitution yet. Um, but I have a, a website. It's www.nsrusa.org. So the NSR is for natural stress relief. The USA is because we currently have three separate organizations. It's an international project. And uh, you, the www and the .org are required. <laughs> yeah. What about if somebody listening wants to reach out to you directly? Do you have an email address associated with the website? Uh, you go to the website and you look for the contact us link and you just click that and whatever you fill into the form will go directly to me. Beautiful. Nobody else. I'm the only person in the organization. My wife sometimes volunteers. Wait, it's, it's solely run by you? It's all, NSR USA is only run by me. Oh. And uh, there are two other organizations that are all also run by individuals. Right on. One is in Italy and one is in um, Brazil. Right on. And we are open to spreading to all languages. It's just that uh, we haven't had uh, volunteers uh, 
serious volunteers as yet. Right. And qualified volunteers for the kinds of massive translation that is needed to make it available in another language. Right. So I handle Italian and, and uh, Portuguese speaking uh, clients as well as English. Right on. I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to ask a question to, to kind of close us out. Unless there's anything else you'd like to add, would you like to add anything else before we close out? I just offer a course that works and hope that people find out about it. That's all. All right. Or you can suffer, continue to suffer. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the main alternative, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, you even continue to suffer when you when you practice an effective form of meditation, because the the suffering can continue as long as there are stresses. And it takes time to release those stresses because we're releasing them naturally. It took many years to acquire them. I've found and I'm, I think this conversation has helped me learn a little bit about my about the organism of my being of Adam, right? I'm like a bit of a mystic. Because anytime I try to do something specific regularly, for some reason, it, I like I'll identify with it and think that's the thing. And then it becomes stale or sure. becomes harmful. And any practice that I've tried, yeah. the only there's practice, a placebo effect. Yeah. And it's like the only practice that has been the, I think why the non duality group is so, I'm so, I feel so connected is, is because it's, it's no practice. There, there actually are some practices that are effective. Oh yeah, that are taught by Muji and Rupert Spira. Yeah, I mean it's like. But I'm not here to talk about them. No, no, Dude, that's the thing. It's like it's about having tools in the in the tool belt. The way I picture it, like access to all sorts of things that are. Yes. The more I learn about these techniques, and the more I learn about these practices, the more readily they intuitively occur on their own. It's like yes, yes, it just arrives. It's it's a wonderful path. As I said twice before, my audience is different. I'm aiming at the majority of the 7.2 billion people on earth. <laughs> and those people are not willing or able to, in, to engage in such a process of introspection. Right. For those people, they want a simple technique that works, period. They don't want to think about things. They don't want to have effort. They want something natural, something effortless that works. They want to take a pill and have an effect. And that's what NSR is. It's that pill to reduce stress, eventually eliminate it. Boom. If, if you don't believe it, take your word for it. Go to the website. Yes, the David. website includes a testimonials page that's very, very long that contains many reports of benefits that people have had. And the funny thing about it is that nowhere do I ask people to contribute to that page. It's, it's their unsolicited comments that I've received. And all I do is I call the person back and I say, here's how it will appear. Is that okay to, for you? You know, your name, your address, is, is, is that okay with you? Um, and, uh, that that's I just check with them to make sure before I publish what they've what they've sent me, but that's all that's all that happens. I I don't, and if they tell me just informally, oh I had this great experience. Sometimes not always, but sometimes I say, would you be willing to submit that to the testimonials page? But they're unsolicited. That is, the course itself doesn't ask people for feedback. The course itself, there's no automatic email sent to people to badger them. Have you done your meditation today? Do your <laughs> meditation. No. You know, if they've learned properly, they want to do their meditation. There's no emails necessary. I have never emailed a client unless they emailed me first. I, I support. I offer four forms of, of support. I have free support and low cost personal support for whatever ails you, for whatever problem or question you have, once you've learned NSR. And before you've learned NSR, if you have questions, I answer those for free, because, you know, obviously that's pre-sales. 
You're supposed to support pre-sales for free. Got to. <laughs> yeah. But but I have to ensure that people pay attention to me. So that's why I charge money, especially for my time. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 uh it's it's an exercise in willingness, really. An exercise in willingness, willingness, willingness. I mean, nothing works unless somebody wants to do it. Like, I can't they have to many... have some indication that they that they have heard about it, that maybe they're hopeful that it will work. Um, but people come either believing that it will work or skeptical that, that it will work. And that those beliefs have no influence whatsoever on whether it works for them or not. It's all about how transcendence is natural. It's a natural form of rest. It eliminates stress. Some people can misinterpret the release of stress as being a bad thing. So that, that's why support can be helpful. Mm. But I've explained it really well in this, in this uh, interview. So anybody who listens to this interview shouldn't need any support at all. You just yeah. take the course, follow the instructions that will work, and you keep meditating every day because you enjoy it, because it works for you. And I'm only here for those people who have questions or, or problems. Most of the time, as I said before, it's because there's somebody who has learned breathing awareness and they keep finding that the breathing awareness is interfering with transcending. Right. So I have to help them through that. Well, th well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing your experience. Thanks You're for welcome. offering offering uh, this new tool in the arsenal of uh, of things that we can do. It's a very, very old tool. It's just been offered for the first time in the modern world <laughs> recently. And it is not, we, by no way are we endorsed by Transcendental Meditation at all. Don't even, no. we don't even like those guys. They can get out of here. <laughs> I, I love I love those guys. I think that they're doing wonder, wonders for the world. I just think that they've got they're too rigid in their policies. That's that's all. Their their egos are just sometimes get involved. But other than that, they're, they're doing. They have a, a program in the school system called the Quiet Time Program that is absolutely wonderful. They'll take a school that has a problem with guns and knives and noise and students unable to learn, and they'll turn that right around. In just a week or two, that school will be quiet. The students will be enjoying their learning. The teachers will love it. And it's such an effective program because they require everybody in the school to practice Transcendental Meditation. Wow, that's awesome. They will not offer the program unless everybody subscribes to doing that. Right. And when they do that, there is such an atmosphere of unity, of progress, of uh, quiet and intelligence that arises just from eliminating those surface level stresses. There's no more guns, no more knives, no more need for metal detectors. I remember being in preschool and like the idea of nobody likes nap time, nobody likes quiet time. But I remember in preschool when they would when my teacher would say, OK, this is the time for quiet time or nap time. It was enjoyable because it was an experience. It was a per, it was like you were given permission to engage in an activity that was no activity. But even as a child, it was still engaging. Adam, you you are a unique person. <laughs> <laughs> you're very lucky. <laughs> I got a good memory. Miss, shouts out to Miss Debbie. Oh, I remember <laughs> mine, too, but mine was not like that. Oh, <laughs> I got lucky. I was at the uh, B'nai Amuna Jewish Community Center. There's a reason why why um, solitary confinement is a punishment in prisons. And the reason is that for more, most people, it's suffering. Oh, yeah. They don't have a natural technique for getting past that suffering, for for even eliminating the suffering entirely and simply being able to observe what's going on and see the stresses leaving one by one. It's such a such a wonderful my wife is just is just in the process of, of discovering how much this is helping her. Um, and it's just so wonderful to see the stresses going. 
you can't it's not a it's not an object it's not like like learning mathematics or physics or history it's it's not that kind of knowledge it's knowledge of how to explore yourself effortlessly and naturally boom so i like to close out with a song you, i have to sing yes please <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah that was great i i think we can all you know um uh, thank you so much for coming on the show you know thank you and, for having me and uh yeah I'll, this is I'll, my first publicity really ever well there was one one little thing in a newspaper but it, it uh, disappeared oh well we got it well this will be there forever <laughs> So uh, yeah, we'll roll out. I like to I like to come up with a song that comes uh, that I try to I try to fit with the theme of the show. And so uh, maybe we can contemplate on what we've just discussed as we roll out. Thank you guys for tuning in. And that's it. Good. We did it. Great. I feel that I've done something very um, useful, very feel a sense of accomplishment. Excellent. Yeah, it's good. It's, um, you know, I know a lot of my listeners, um, I don't really know that, like, I know some, but like. Do you know how many you have? No, um, I see, I see numbers on the SoundCloud, um, somewhere between 100 to 200 a week. Um, but I, I'm not, I don't have the numbers on Spotify or Apple podcasts. Um, and then they That's also strange. You would think that they would want to give you metrics. You have to, you have to get, I'd have to get like a, a widget plugin into my RSS feed. It would just take a little work on my end. I just don't, oh. I don't care about the numbers. <laughs> you know? That's really, really weird. Cause I, they, they give me metrics about my website. So yeah, why wouldn't WordPress? they give you web metrics about a blog? Well, because I have I have metrics on my website, but the actual like the actual audio content is being distributed through several different platforms. So it's not it's not, people don't just go to my website. People are subscribed on different platforms. So when this releases, they get a notification on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Right, but I don't understand why these different platforms wouldn't automatically give you metrics as in exchange for carrying your your audio. Yeah, I don't understand either. That's weird. Maybe they do. Maybe I just haven't. Metrics just haven't... don't cost anything. I mean, they, they the, the information is basically there already. All they have to do is program for it, and I'm sure they do anyway just to see which podcasts are, are popular and which podcasts aren't. They have to know that, and they can only know that through metrics. Yeah, I just Googled it. I should probably look into this. Apparently, maybe I can, I can see them through the service I'm releasing the show on. That could be, too. But yeah, this is, yeah, it's, it feels good. Like it feels good to share. It feels good to know that you're, you're sharing something that's going out there, you know? I feel that way. Yeah. Thanks to you. Yeah. Thanks for joining. I'll uh, let's uh, let's we'll reconvene later on. Okay. All right. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Later, dude. Bye.